right. Uh, welcome to uh, my session at Jacks London. My name is John Stevenson. Uh, I work for uh, a company called Salesforce, also at Heroku, with the t-shirts. Uh, we do stuff in the cloud. If you want to know more, then ask me afterwards. Um, uh, so I'm going to give you uh, sort of gen fairly gentle introduction into Clojure. Uh, so I'm going to give you a fairly introduction into Clojure and uh, enhanced functional programming on the JVM. I'm assuming that because it's Jax London that everybody's like a Java developer. Is anybody not a Java developer? Or done Java developer? Okay, that's a self safe assumption there. Has anybody done any Clojure already? Right, you can go. <laughs> no, <I'm joking. laughs> um, if I get if I get anything wrong, let me know. Um, has anybody done any Scala? Oh, okay, I can do some Scala bashing, excellent. <laughs> I'll try every time. Um, has anybody done any any Haskell? Right, you can definitely get out of there. <laughs> no, it's, uh, I, I love Haskell, yeah, but I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, not, um, I'm not big on types, so uh, it's why I like Clojure uh, more than Haskell. Um, has anybody done any Lisp? You can definitely, <laughs> no, you can definitely help me, actually, yes. You can help me if I get anything wrong. But uh, yeah, if you've done any Lisp, then pretty much most of this will be pretty straightforward. Uh, because Clojure is a, a list, uh, a basically a list processing language. So you'll see everything is a list. You'll get to understand that everything you do in Clojure is a list, um, which may feel a bit strange at first, and you'll say, like, well, why have we got all these brackets here? And then you'll come to realize that actually the brackets are just in a slightly different place. Um, and there aren't any more brackets. There's probably actually less brackets, and there's certainly less semicolons. Um, you see the hilarious example I haven't seen that, no, but yeah, it's certainly, yeah, you're certainly using no more and probably less like special characters uh, in Clojure than you would do in Java, um, or even Scala, uh, yeah, in Scala. Uh, okay, so I've got a, a web tutorial that I'm going to go through at some point. Just going to give you, just a, like a, a brief, quick, a few slides just to give you a really kind of high level overview of Clojure, and then we'll get into some actual code and see what it actually looks like. Um, so I've got, <coughs> that's the web tutorial, so I've got a couple of slides, these are online as well, these are just at <coughs> jrocket.co.uk. Um, so Clojure, I mean, anybody can do it, it's, it's a, just a general purpose programming language, so you can use it for anything and everything that you want to, uh, to do uh, in terms of programming. <coughs> there, are, there are some uh, not really nice features, but pretty much you can, re you can anything you can do in Java, anything you can do in Scala, you can do in Clojure. There's, there's no kind of limitation there. Um, it's originally, it was written for the JVM and it's a lot optimized for using the Java virtual machine because the Java <coughs> virtual machine has this lot, really long history now of being an excellent platform to run your applications on. We know how powerful it is because we've done so in, with all our Java applications. Um, <coughs> so we're actually using that. So we're actually writing closure code, but it's generating Java bytecode just like Java does just like Scala does, just like JRuby does, just like Jypen does, like Jaskal, all the other languages that are on the JVM. They're all converted, it's all bytecode in the end. So it's, you can actually just ship a jar file um, and it will run if you've got Clojure in the environment. If you don't, then you can sh ship what we call an Uber jar, which is, clo which is a, your application as a jar file, but we also stick the Clojure jar file in there as well. And you can run it in any Java environment. Any environment that's got Java running on it, you can run Clojure, because it's all bytecode. Um, and, and therefore, if, as it's bytecode, as it's Java underneath, th there are types underneath. So it's a, it's a dynamic language, but it's, it's not um, statically typed. It's dynamically typed, so that the types you don't have to define yourself. So all the extra coding you do when you're doing Java, um, you don't have to do it. You don't have to define types up front which gives it a really flexible, really dynamic kind of language. <coughs> and it's, um, yeah, if you've done any Lisp whatsoever, it'll be fairly familiar. We've modernized it so that uh, not everything is around brackets. We put square brackets and wibbly brackets in there as well, just to make it a little bit more readable, uh, and just modernized Lisp a little bit. I made it optimal because um, if you're gonna run Lisp, then where you're going to run it on, um, Java, the JVM gives a really nice platform to run any, any kind of modern language. 
Um, there's tons of people using Clojure up there. I'm not going to go through that. If you want kind of examples of who's using it, then we can go through that as well. Um, uh, <coughs> so why do I love it? Uh, well, it's really simple. That's the one thing. I'm a quite simple person. Um, I don't do Clojure every day, uh, unfortunately. Um, but it's a language that's absolutely tiny. Uh, it's it's kind of the antithesis of Scala, which has everything in it, which is good and challenging at the same time. Uh, where Clojure is absolutely tiny. There's actually about 12 primitives that make up Clojure. There's probably a lot more that make up Scala. Yeah. I think you get 12 primitives in every single uh, file, file you get um, with, with Scala. It's, it's quite, quite a big language where uh, it's like a lot of big tools, a lot of really powerful tools, a lot of really uh, interesting academic stuff that they put into Scala to deal with really big uh, projects and really big issues. Whereas uh, Clojure, in a way, is a bit more, I like to think it's a bit more agile. It's actually encouraging you to decompose problems. So like you take a really big bowl of money, you decompose it into really, really small pieces, uh, and Clojure really encourages all that. It's a very modular kind of approach. Uh, typically, you will define some data structures. Some inf you'll understand what the data model is that you're working with. You'll break that down into into kind of some elegant data structures, and then you'll define your functions, which are equivalent to methods in, in Java. That's your behavior, and those those uh, those functions will work on those data structures and give you results. They'll give you values back, um, and everything that you do, all your behavior always returns a value. Uh, a null is considered. So it's very straightforward. You're, you're essentially doing like simple mathematics. You're, you've got a, a function that takes in some piece of data. It does something to that data, and then returns it. Except it doesn't actually change the data. It's all immutable. So the information that you got there. So it's like having a Java program where everything is final, maybe even more so than like super final. Um, so everything you're creating is, uh, is is stateless by default, so that other parts of your program can't interfere with your file. So when you're doing a function, nothing from the outside world can interfere with it, which makes it really easy to actually do coding because you don't have to worry about other like, threads or things interfering with the data that you're working on. Uh, and here's like the world's simplest, I don't think it actually works, but it's the world's simplest structure for a, a Java project, so, uh, a closure project. So we've got, we've got a namespace, you think about like a Java packages. Um, so basically, just defining the scope of where this behavior, where this data is within your application. Um, and we're defining a piece of data and we're giving it a name. So this is called binding. So we're binding my, the, the name my data to this data structure, which is just simply like an array. It's actually called a vector enclosure, but what comes up. Um, and as you see, that we've got uh, one, two, three frog. Uh, frog should probably be a string actually to make that compile. Um, yeah, yeah, or something defined somewhere else. Uh, and we don't actually need the uh, comments, but I didn't want to scare you too much. Um, and so a data structure can be any kind of data because Clojure will work it out uh, for you. You don't need to define that one is an integer, two is an integer, three is an integer, that sort of thing. You don't need to define frog is a string. Clojure will work it out for you. Um, and then you can define a function. That will take a parameter uh, and <coughs> so uh, and then do some behavior. So here we're just doing string. We're just turning it into a string essentially. So when we call do stuff with my my data, it's basically just going to uh, pass it out as a string. And if you can understand that, you can probably understand a lot of closure stuff. So you can you can all go now and uh, go get some more coffee. No, I joke. I joke. I joke. Uh, there we go. Uh, and, and so this is very, very much like a data, data centric. Can you just, what, what does it do? Does it, does it what, concatenate the, the element? The I'll actually show you. I'll actually do code. Uh, we'll actually do some live. Yeah. I'll say it live. But <laughs> live evaluation of okay. code. Not actually coding because I've written most of it already. Um, but you'll see um, it specifically how it works. Um, so there's a lot of it. It's very data orientated. <coughs> so you typically, the way you design a, a closure application, you think about what kind of data you want to work with. Uh, you define a nice data structure. There's some built-in data structures uh, into Clojure that we'll see, um, and and then you just run behavior on top of it. That's essentially what you're doing, and then you're all doing that within the scope of the packaging, the, the namespaces in Clojure. So it's fairly straightforward. 
Uh, and there's some really nice data structures. So these are built into the language. So you don't really define your own types. <laughs> you don't need to spend time defining your own type hierarchy. You don't need to worry about encapsulation and stuff like that. We, it's not really big on encapsulation uh, closure. It, polymorphism, there is some stuff there as well, but encapsulation, yeah. Um, if you really need to do types, you can rewrite some of this in Java really quickly if you really wanted like a type system or in Scala. Uh, but you've got these uh, four built-in uh, data structures, which are all immutable, so they're all stateless, so you don't have to worry. So making doing um, uh, asynchronous uh, programming uh, enclosure is really simple. In fact, we've got an asynchronous library that helps you do even more stuff. Um, but you've got these uh, persistent data structures, which um, allow you to kind of just manage data and just put you just put your data into these uh, data structures and um, uh, you can you can do you can work with data very very efficiently because what they do is actually share memory so that because they're immutable you can't change them so you create a list of one two three and you want to add four to that list you're not actually adding four to the original list you're actually creating a copy of list one two three and, and in that new copy you're actually adding four but if you're doing that for a really big list, that might seem hideously inefficient because you, if you copy thousands and thousands of times, then you'd have thousands of lists with like massive amounts of information. In. But what we actually do is we share information. So that new list that's going to have one, two, three, four in actually has only four in it. So it has one, uh, the, the, the number four in it, and a link back to all the, uh, the original list. So it just shares memory. And, uh, Different example of that as well, and you can build up data structures like this. Like you can just, uh, we'll go through some of this as well. But you can just basically just come up with a really useful, really kind of. You can actually look at the data structure and actually um, assume a lot about what the program actually is going to do and what what it's all about very very easily. So you don't have to read through like tons and tons of different objects and classes to actually understand what the program's doing. You can typically just look at a data structure and say, oh okay, I start to understand. This isn't a great example. Uh, this is just like a Example. We've got some more things here. So again, here's a better example. So if I want to look for a location, I can have a location which is London, which has latitude and longitude. So we're just using here. We're just using maps of maps. So a location is a map with a. So a map is just a key um, key value pair. So here we've got internally we've got um, a key and a value. So we've got latitude as a key uh, and 34 as its value, longitude is a key, um, uh, 57 is value, and because we've got these, uh, this colon in front of the name, that means it's a keyword. So we can actually use this keyword, we can actually uh, ask uh, location, uh, and give it this latitude keyword, and it will return the result 34. But we'll see some of that as well as we go along. So let's, uh, let's do some some live coding to show you actually what's going on. So I've got this uh, navy little tool called uh, Light Table, which is actually written in Clojure. Uh, it's actually written in Clojure Script, uh, which runs on the JVM. So it's actually running in the browser. Um, uh, but it's all Clojure, essentially. Uh, it's just Clojure that runs on the, J uh, on the, um, uh, Java version, um, on the JavaScript engine. Uh, so I've, I've started a, a runtime environment called a REPL. So I can go in and evaluate uh, all the things, which is nice. I'll give it a fix. So here I've defined uh, my data, one, two, three, frog. You see, I don't actually need um, I don't actually need the commas in between uh, one, two, three. I can put commas in between there. <coughs> uh, so we oh spoilers there we go. Um, so define a piece of my data, and it's just giving me this is just a reference to show that I've defined something. I've, I've basically bound the name, um, uh, which has got this is the it's actually it's fully qualified name. So this is the uh, namespace, like the packaging uh, structure. So if I actually look at the f file hierarchy, 
I'll have a folder called Closure to Code, uh, I'll have a file name called uh, XX Jacks London, and then inside that I've got a, a name called My Data. So that's, the, that's, a, that's giving us the scope of where this thing is defined and how we can access it. Uh, and this is, uh, this is a vector, like an array-like structure, uh, which has yeah, all sorts of different kinds of information in it. And uh, so we've evaluated that. So, so if I can refer to my data now, uh, and, um, do that now. and Closure will tell me what it actually is. So if I do my data and evaluate that, it simply returns that data structure, that data information for me. Uh, and I can define a, um, <coughs> I can define a function here, um, so define that function here, and I can run, I can then call that function, call do stuff. So again, it's given me the fully qualified uh, name for that function. Uh, as I'm in that scope, as I'm in that namespace, I don't need to give it the full, uh, full package name. Uh, and then I can just basically evaluate it, and it gives me the response. <coughs> That's not very pretty, it's kind of a big string, and it's not very nice. So what you can do here, I'm just using this string function on data, but I can actually do, I can use functions with functions as well. So I can put something called map, uh, which will uh, basically run string over each element of my data structure. Uh, and if I redefine that, uh, and then re-evaluate this, it's slightly different, it's much nicer. Uh, it's giving me a different result, so I can instantly see what functions are doing when I combine them. And it's, it's, it's one way that Clojure works, you combine functions together <coughs> to get more and more effect. So it's almost like a, a fractal probing sometimes, it's very much uh, uh, you know, building on one function is doing one thing very specifically and you chain them together in a way so that they do more elegant things. So a lot of Clojure is just really, really small, simple functions that you can use together to do actually more powerful stuff. Um, uh, yeah. Cool. Any questions so far? Does that sound fairly straightforward? W one question. Yeah. Um, I noticed that the angular brackets became um, round brackets after your map. Is that a different data structure? Not the same. Ah, yes. Yes. Good point. Um, <coughs> so let's just talk about uh, let's talk about lists briefly. So if you notice that this, I'm defining here. I'm defining a name. Um, for my data structure. And to do so, I'm using a function called def. And to call def, I have to put it into a list. Everything is a, a list. Everything is a list underneath, really. Uh, it's, it's, it's called list for a reason, because everything in Clojure is a list. Even an array is, is a list, but it's got special characteristics. Uh, so we actually use the square brackets to kind of add <coughs> more, um, more semantics on top of that. So. When you, re when you get a return value, you often get uh, uh, that as default uh, as a list. Because a list is uh, just a data structure as well. The, the unique thing about a list is that the, the first element of that list is always assumed to be uh, like a function call, like a method call. Um, so um, usually when you return things, especially when you're mapping over uh, stuff, you will return a list by default. If you want something else, then you can, um, you can and coerce it to be a different data structure call. So what was the original data structure you had to the angular uh, String, uh, I think that was just a vector, because it was basically vector. turning a vector into a string. So it was actually a string that was a vector. Um, yeah, so it was uh, not particularly useful uh, data structure, I don't think, but yes, it, that's essentially a little bit. Uh, I meant the, the one you had when you first defined my data. Oh, this one, oh yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, so this, is, this is just a vector, this is just an array. So uh, yeah, so a vector is an array. It's uh, it's an indexed uh, data structure. Um, so you can refer to it. Um, uh, yeah, you can call my data zero, <coughs> my data one, my data two, that sort of thing. Uh, whereas list is just a like a linked list. Okay. Yeah. And so when you add things to it, you just add it to the front. It, it's, so you've got um, <coughs> uh, like linear lookup time. So it's it's not the most efficient uh, lookup. Uh, so you would use an array, if, you need, if you've got like, a really big number and you need to find the one in the middle, you use an array for that. The same thing you would use a vector. Right. Uh, and maps are just really good for like, key value pairs. Um, 
Uh, and so you can do things. There's some built-in uh, mappings of names, so I can, I can look at the closure version of things. Uh, so I'm, I know what version of closure I'm running. <coughs> and closure is just a library. I've just included closure as a um, as a library. I didn't. You don't need to install closure when you get going. Um, so if I look at the project uh, configuration uh, <coughs> file, which is just project clj here, um, I'm, call, I'm calling def project. So that's just another function call. Uh, I'm giving it a name. This is the name of my project. This is the version of my project. That's a bit. That looks like Maven. It is. We use the same kind of Maven kind of uh, naming numbering conventions for our projects. Uh, we've also got this dependency, which is probably the most uh, interesting thing in uh, this particular project. So I've actually got uh, org closure closure, which is a library, which is like uh, the closure library and the version. So when I actually run this project, if I don't have versions, uh, version one point seven closure, it will download it just like Maven downloads the internet for me. Um, this is a little bit quicker because it's just one file, um, and, and that's the entire closure environment. It's the it's the runtime, it's the compiler. So like uh, like Java has uh, Java C for compiling stuff. Closure has its own compiler to compile uh, Closure into uh, into um, bytecode. So you actually only need the Java runtime environment. You don't need the full Java SDK because you're not using those tools. Uh, any questions so far? Uh, not I want to. There we go. Uh, <coughs> and you can do uh, simple math. So one thing you may have noticed is that we're doing uh, what we call infix. Uh, sorry, prefix notation. So in Java, you wouldn't write that. In Java, you'd do uh, 1 plus 2 plus 3. That's a bit tedious, isn't it? Um, so you don't need to do that with, uh, with closure. So closure, we're saying we want to apply the function plus to, to this data. So if you've got long numbers, you don't need to worry about, I don't need to define a whole bunch of um, Functions called plus that has one argument and then another one has two arguments, and another one has three arguments. It will take multi like variable uh, length uh, arguments uh, for most functions, and that's typically how you write a lot of closure as well. So I can just call it do 15. I can do uh, oh, 15. Uh, yeah, I can call <coughs> uh, an embed to. So because it's a prefix, then it, it's got a definite order. It's just like when you're doing mathematics and you're not quite sure wh whether you to do you multiply or you divide first or you are doing it. Modification. Because we're using um, uh, functions, we, we're demarcating each function by a, a list. So we've actually got here, we've actually got this. Uh, this is a, a list, so we'll evaluate this uh, uh, value, which gives us 6. Uh, we'll evaluate uh, this as well. Uh, uh, and then, then, we, then we'll take that value. So closure will take that value 12, and then it'll put it into here. So this would be then, so that would evaluate, that would be replaced by 12 um, as, as closure's evaluating it, 48. And then you would take these numbers and feed it back into the whole shebang and give you the result. So that's how it's, that's how you would read, uh, typically read uh, closure, you would start from the inside out, you start from the inner brackets, but what's that value, what's it giving me, um, and then what's it working with here, so we, we've got uh, 12, and then we times it by 4, and so on and so on, and then you work your way out. Uh, that's the like the classic lisp. There is like some uh, a nice way you can do, you can rewrite that, and we'll come across that in a minute. You can also do Java interoperation, uh, inter uh, yeah, interoperability, you can call Java stuff. So anything that's on running on a JVM, <coughs> any libraries you can call. So here I'm, I'm just uh, calling the uh, the Java lang string uh, object. It's got a function called, it's got a method uh, called uh, two uppercase, which I'm sure you've probably used in the past. Yes. Um, so it's just taking a string and converting it to it. So that's, I'm calling Java there. That's, that's, it's written in Closure, but I'm essentially calling Java. Java, um, a Java method on the string, uh, the Java lang string class, and every closure project mm -hmm. has uh, Java lang uh, already there, so you don't need to include it. If Java lang, everything in Java lang is already uh, <coughs> part of your closure project. Those ways work in closure scripts. 
Uh, no, no. In closure script, <coughs> I'll come to that. But yeah, in closure script, uh, you wouldn't call JavaScript. Uh, so there is a there is a move now to write closure so that it works both in in closure on JVM and closure on closure script as well. Uh, but uh, this is just to just show you how easy it is to do. Uh, so if you're moving from Java, then yeah, it's very easy to reuse a lot of the existing libraries you've got already. Um, and here I'm just calling uh, uh, Java-like system. So you notice there's a slight difference here. So there's a, there's a method called two uppercase. And um, <coughs> this is um, this is a method of string, which is in there. But it's, uh, it's not a static method. So we actually have to create an instance of the string object. So this is what this little full stop does. So rather than doing uh, string my string equals new string red dot to and then doing uh, my string dot to upper, which is quite a lot of code to write, I can just basically call um, uh, two uppercase on the string. And closure underneath generates the, the necessary code to just post process it. Um, <coughs> system get property is a static method, so we can just basically call it straight away. We don't need to create an object because it's a static method, so we can just call it really easily. And there's lots of stuff in the maths class that you can call really, really easily. <coughs> uh, so actually, using using uh, Java using Java is really easy if you uh, if, you're, if you're that way inclined. And doing things like, like if you ever did like swing programming, it's actually a lot nicer to do in Closure than it is to do in uh, Java. Uh, you don't have to worry about anonymous uh, or inner methods uh, in other uh, classes and so on. I can pull in things like uh, here we're just pulling in a file and uh, turning out the results. Uh, here I'm then taking the results of that file. So this is the project definition file uh, I'm doing. And then I'm actually just going to uh, convert that into a string so it's nicer. Um, and then I simply just uh, get one particular element of that uh, string here. So I just get the version of the project. So I'm actually chaining all these functions together. And yeah, it's, it takes a little bit of use to get reading that. So one other alternative way of writing that is to use, um, uh, you can reformat it, but you can use something called uh, the threading macro. We'll come to macros in a minute. But basically, this allows you to uh, pass the result of this will then be passed to the next function on the next line, and the result of this. So you actually have your the result of projects, evaluating projects, CLJ, will go here where these uh, um, commas are, and then the result of slurp, and then the, the value of project will go here, and that will evaluate that, uh, and then that the other one will go, and then the result of read string will go in here, uh, uh, and so on. So it's, um, it's it makes it a little bit easier to actually Makes it a bit easier to actually read it, and we get the same result essentially. We get the, the version of it. So it's it's a nice kind of way to actually actually make it look a bit more like uh, the um, um, the iterative programming that you're kind of used to, the, the procedural programming you're used to, but still doing a, a functional approach. Does that make sense? Yeah, we're still sleeping. We're still awake. Uh, we go. Uh, so another example here, we've got. Uh, <coughs> This is the threading macro in action. So, boom. oh, there's the threading macro in action. Oh, I need the space. There we go. Um, and you can also do uh, it in reverse as well. So, this is back. What do you think that's good? Because we're actually using uh, a double. Uh, if it's got, now we've got a double head, then it actually puts the, um, the result uh, as, the, as the, the last thing. So, it would actually go here. Here. So when we run that, it goes sort of backwards. This is a bit Yoda there. And then there's, yeah, working with strings is really straightforward. Um, <laughs> print line, if you're all familiar with print line. Um, oh, what's what's print line returned? Yeah. Let's say that, yes, nil. It's a bit of a clue. Um, why hasn't it, re why hasn't it return my string? Hmm. Because it's not actually a return value, it's void, it's just printed at the console. Makes sense. It's not showing the console. Yes, I'm not showing the console. Uh, I did have a console somewhere, but yes. You can just click on that, uh, that one of the things in the bottom and it'll show it. Yeah, somewhere. Nice lumpy. Yeah. yeah. Uh, anyway, so right down the bottom, if you can see that. Right down the bottom there. Uh, it's actually printed the. Uh, 
returns it. So print line actually just returns the value nil. It still returns a value, it has to return a value because it's a function in closure. You can't have a function that doesn't return a value, it's, that doesn't work. Um, which also gives you like a lot of flexibility. So when you, you don't have to worry about types because closure is always going to return you some kind of value that it's going to understand. Um, and so here we're actually just printing out a message to the, the console, so it's like standard out. So you can still use print line for um, debugging, but you wouldn't actually return that information back to. So if, you, if another function called print line, it would get nil. So it wouldn't be very. It wouldn't actually get the string. So you would use something like string, which is a proper function that doesn't have any side effects. So print line is actually kind of a, a thing that gives you a side effect, which we try and avoid in closure. So it's actually changing states of something outside itself. It's actually changing state of the, the standard out of the console. That's something to be wary of. Uh, oh, there's tons of maths. I'm not going to go through the maths. Oh, except for this one. Actually, is this one a good example? Right. So we've got um, 2 divided by 1. What do you think that will equal? Uh, uh, that's not a good example. <coughs> but 22 divided by 7. Roughly. What was it roughly? 5. Oh, yeah. There we go. Uh, what if we just do that? Three. Uh, so, uh, oh, that's nasty. So it's actually returning the value 22 over 7. So actually, um, uh, 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 it's, why do you think it's doing that? Why do you think it's actually returning a value? Yes. It's returning a ratio type too. Yeah, so this is, this is called a ratio type. And why it's doing it is it's this idea of lazy evaluation. Uh, we, we like doing a lot of things lazily in closure. It's not because we are lazy, but uh, things don't always need to be worked out right this second. So if I if I calculate um, 22 over 7 and I get something appro approximate to pi, I've calculated that to a certain decimal value. But how do I know what decimal value to calculate it to? Uh, and if I calculate to just two decimal points, then I might need more precision uh, later on, but I've already lost precision already because I've, I've, I've done like 22 over 7 equals 3.14, but I actually need uh, a more accurate version. If I'm doing if I'm doing just like simple maths, then that might be fine. If I'm doing graphics, then and I'm kind of trying to get a beautiful circle, then I might need more uh, specific precision on that calculation. So if I still just keep 22 over 7 uh, going, then I can calculate and evaluate it many, many more times to lots of different levels of precision at the time I actually know what precision I actually want. Maybe if you multiply later by 7, that will turn it back into 22, is that the idea? Um, you know, well, that's fine, actually. Let's see. Uh, I've never tried that. Yeah, if you that's do the result of that, then the further yeah. calculation, you need to multiply by 7. Yeah. Uh, that's an interesting idea. Yeah. Uh, what, what, what does that give me? Interesting. Yeah. That's something to Google. But yeah, um, <coughs> there is uh, there is a few things that are kind of close just to kind of make sure that, uh, it kind of tries to um, show you that something has kind of changed and changed back again as well. Um, that's an interesting one. Yeah. Um, what other ones we got? But there's a lot. Of, yeah. It, here we're still we're still kind of returning uh, the smallest possible fraction number essentially. So it will try and make the smallest kind of thing uh, there. Uh, so the three, the times in by three and the divided by three it essentially cancels it out and just gives you the smallest kind of number. So I think if you do um, divide uh, 12, um, uh, 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 eight by 16, so it gives you a half. So it actually reduces it down to the smallest number. So it's actually, it's when you calculate that, you're still going to get a particular value. Um, you're still going to get the same result, but you can kind of, uh, you're still waiting to evaluate that, what the actual result is. It's big end. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so there are, um, there uh, there's lots of stuff, math stuff I'm going to skip over. Uh, true and false, so you, can, you can find out whether something's true or false or not. Um, uh, Any 
pressure so far. Does it seem easy enough? Am I explaining it well enough? There we go. Uh, get through well enough. So we can use our data structures. So we can define a whole bunch of data structures. Um, so we define lists. Uh, the interesting thing with lists is if um, so to find a list like that, it gives me a re result. But if I'm trying to uh, define a list just by doing one, two, three, four, um, it's going to fail. Uh, and why is it going to fail? Well, because the first thing is not a function. Um, so we've got this uh, special way of, of letting Clojure know that we don't want to evaluate that first element. So we've got this idea of quote. Uh, so we've got this quote value, this quote function saying, uh, just treat all of that as um, as data, essentially. And there's a shortcut here which just makes it easier to type, which is the actual quote character. So again, that's just returning as a, a, a list. Um, and we can do all sorts of stuff. Again, we can put anything we want inside a list. Typically, lists are used for defining your behavior rather than actually defining um, the, uh, uh, the like, data you're working with. Uh, vectors and maps are used a lot more flexible. Uh, I mean, we can create sets as well. Uh, sets is just um, uh, a, a, a unique set of, um, of values. So it can be any kind of values, but they just have to be unique. Uh, and they're not ordered by default, but you can use a function called a sorted set to actually create them as well. And we've got vectors, which is kind of the workhorse. You can kind of put all sorts of weird and wonderful stuff in vectors. And obviously, you can have an empty vector as well, same as you can have an empty list and an empty set. Um, so when you can put all sorts of stuff, you can put other data structures in data structures. Um, and we don't have to worry about uh, quoting vectors as well. It's always treated out as pure data. <coughs> and then maps. Maps are uh, probably my favorite uh, thing. You can do all sorts of funky stuff with maps. Uh, you can even build, uh, <coughs> like, it's quite common to kind of build um, uh, uh, kind of structures like this. So I've got a map. Um, Star Wars characters, uh, and we've got Jedi, we've got Sith droids, blah, blah, blah. Um, and <coughs> different ships as well. So it, it kind of very easily, it, it's, it's almost like JSON, really. If you're familiar with JSON, it's kind of that kind of structure. So it's a very easy way, but you've got that as, a, as your data structures with inside your, your program. Uh, and so um, yeah, I can define individual projects. So here I've got, I'm actually defining a data structure called Star Wars characters, and um, it's got all the different characters there, and, and now we can then just get uh, that information out. So if I want to look at the Star Wars character Luke, it will give me uh, the information around that. So I get the full <coughs> name and uh, the skill back in return. Um, so that's returning the map that's associated with the, the Luke keyword. So this is, this map is essentially is just a value uh, because it's part of a bigger map. So I've got a map here, which is my data structure. So I've got a basic key, uh, this is a key and this is a value, uh, this is the key and this is the value, and I can pull out, I ask for the key, and then I get the value, the value just happens to be another map. And you, uh, because this is nested, then I can also go and get uh, not just loop, but actually a specific value from that map that's returned. And, and I just get the full name, or I can get skill and so on. <coughs> And then there's some nice little shortcuts, so I can actually uh, get in the Star Wars characters Luke's full name. So it's almost like human readable. I mean, you can show that to a business analyst so you can actually understand what it was you were doing. Yes, there's a question. What kind of um, what kind of stuff can be key? I mean, can I have uh, anything direction? can be key, but typically we use uh, keywords because you get this. Well, because you'll get what I'm going to show you in a second. You get this way of actually just <coughs> using the key as a as a function call. So I can actually just use uh, the data structure uh, and pass it the key and it will give me uh, the result. So I don't actually need to use that get function. Um, I mean get function typically makes it uh, a little bit more readable, uh, especially when you're starting, but yeah, I can actually use the, the keyword as essentially a function call or, or a map. But actually, it, you can it talk could to use a map. any type of key. Yeah, you can yeah. Use, yeah, it's like strings you can use, you can use, yeah, you can use numbers, characters, whatever you want. Um, I've never tried to use li lists or vectors, but yeah, it'll be interesting. I haven't seen pe many people do that, but yeah, it might be. It wouldn't surprise me if you do that. I mean, again, they're just values. So <coughs> it, 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 
there is no reason why you can do it. So just sorry, just a question about the case. Is it is, is the case sensitive? Can you use camel case? So you seem to use a lot. Of oh right, yes. Okay, we typically use something called kebab case. Yeah, is that which is nice. Uh, yeah. So uh, I, I imagine that uh, Star Wars is my meat, and I've got a kebab kind of skewer going all the way through it. That's why it's called kebab case. Yeah. Um, and it's just yeah, it's just a convention that they yeah. use when they wrote the language, and everybody else sticks to it. So yeah, yeah. I think it's a bit more readable than camel case, but uh, I'm a bit biased. Using it. Yeah, you can use Camcast if you really want to, but people go, <laughs> and they look at you go, um, grow up, maybe. Um, uh, okay. uh, and you can also like, look at the types underneath <laughs> as well. So if you do want to know what's actually going on in terms of types, uh, you can actually look at, uh, so a vector is actually a persistent vector. And so this is something that's been written in Clojure. Uh, so all the all the collections, the lists, the arrays, the vectors, and the sets, they're all, they're all written in closure. But if you um, if you go and ask for the class of one, uh, what do you think that's going to be? Yeah, it's going to be Java long. So it's actually just using Java and I mean, on, in closure scripts, it, it'll use uh, the JavaScript equivalent. <coughs> but uh, here we've got, yeah, we can do class of, of a string. And that's going to be Java Lang string. That's what it. So it, it closely uses a lot of Java underneath, and all the types uh, are Java underneath as well. Um, uh, there's a question at the back. Uh, what's the what the term type of this Java Lang long? Is it an object, class object, or <coughs> so? It, it is actually a, yeah, it's a Java Lang long. Underneath, it's a it's a Java Lang long uh, long object. Well, so I mean, I mean the return type of the the class function. Cool. So That's so what, is, find out. What, what is it that, that, that calling class return? Uh, that's a good point. Let's have a look. Uh, nobody's ever asked me that one before. What do you mean like that? Uh, uh, Java Lang class. Okay. Thank, you. Okay. Thank you. That's an interesting question. Uh, <coughs> and so you can use, uh, use data structures as well. Um, so we can define uh, all sorts of So we've, we've done this idea of what we call binding, so giving a name to a data structure already. And um, yeah, we can bind uh, my list to that, and then we can just simply call my list. If it's a name, we can just ask it for a name. We don't need to put it in the list. We don't need to put it in a data structure or anything. It's just it, it just evaluates to uh, to its value. Uh, and we can also use um, functions to create our data structure. So here we're going to um, actually add four uh, to my list. So when I do my list again, oh, that might be. You didn't have to call the function first, right? It's the next one Oh, OK. Oh, yes. Thank you. Um, I told you it was a bit. So it's actually, <coughs> uh, so you see, we're actually, <coughs> I did that first, um, So I've actually got my list, and we're running a function that adds a value to my list. <coughs> As you can see, my list hasn't changed because it's persistent. It's a persistent data structure. It's immutable. It doesn't change. Um, but the result of that has changed. The result of applying uh, cons, which basically uh, uh, construct a new list uh, from for and my list, uh, it returns a brand new list uh, underneath. And as we mentioned, that, that actually. This new list only contains the new values, uh, and not one, two, three is actually pointers to the original my list. So that way, it makes it very, very efficient way of uh, of, of storing uh, all this uh, data you're going to generate. <coughs> so it's quite common you will generate lots of data structures as you uh, work on them, but then they'll go out of scope pretty quickly. So uh, once they once they're out of scope of the, the function or, or a let binding, which is just like a local assignment, then they get tidied away, uh, just like any other objects that are uh, out of scope in, in Java as well. Uh, is there any other interesting stuff we can do? Um, and you can use you can use keywords any way you want in like vectors and so on. It doesn't need to be just maps, but maps are the most common things. Uh, we've done maps examples already, haven't we? So we've done all this already, where we can ask for um, event details. Uh, get a return and, and also use use these keywords as functions, which 
I quite like it. It's very, very uh, cool way of using uh, Clojure. And here we've got a portfolio. And we can actually just go and uh, get a um, particular um, uh, element of, it, of the portfolio that we've got here. So here we've just got a vector uh, of values. And each value is a map in itself. So when we ask for portfolio zero, just like uh, any other thing we'd be using with Java, it's, it's giving us the first element of the, of the array, the first element of the vector, uh, and so on and so on. And um, we can also use functions, there's quite a uh, use of functions called first, which obviously gets to the first element, uh, last, which gets you the, the last element, and rest, which is a really nice. So you run first, you, um, you get the first element, you do rest, you get everything else after that. So it's a nice kind of way to actually process, like skip through uh, a, a data structure. So you get the first element, it returns you um, the first element. You get the rest, it returns the data structure with everything but the first one. So then, and then you return rest on that, and return rest on that. You can process through, uh, iterate, it's actually iterate through a data structure very, very easily. Um, <coughs> So all this is on uh, GitHub as well, so you can go through this a bit more uh, uh, time, and you can run other functions. So a lot of it is, is a lot of learning Clojure, uh, well, you've actually learned pretty much most of the syntax already to write Clojure, as, as, as you've seen. Uh, most of it is actually just learning the different functions that are inside Clojure as well. Um, and so, yeah, so here I've got uh, Evil Empire, which is just a set, and I can run contains on it. Uh, so yeah, Evil Empire does contain Darth Vader. And contains, yeah, just gives us uh, a nice way to go and see does does this set. Kind of, so I can I can run contains on a collection using a key. So a key here is a string. My collection is Evil Empire. So I can run it on any collection I want. Um, and um, it, it's going to give me uh, a true or false uh, result. So this is um, this when we've got a question mark on the end. It's another little naming convention in uh, Clojure, which uh, means it's a, it's a predicate. It's going it's, it's basically asking a question. It's asking whether something is true or false. <coughs> so we put a little question mark on it. So it's really easy to see what this does. Um, we do lots of kind of little things like that. If we're going to change state, then we um, we'll put. Um, um, we will put uh, like a little uh, exclamation mark or something if we don't actually change state. Is that just a convention? Yeah, it's just a convention. You can you can still write a function that doesn't use these, that doesn't have these symbols on, uh, but it's uh, it's it's useful to kind of uh, to do that as well. Um, so all these things we've done so far um, are uh, they're working on uh, code that's not changing state, so we're not changing anything whatsoever. If you do need to change state, because we're not doing Haskell here. We do need to uh, change state at some point. We <coughs> change state. I'm not joking. Um, then you would um, you would define something called an atom or a reference, um, which um, actually is change is like a value that can be changed, but it does so in a, a very controlled way. It's like having a an atomic database inside uh, inside your uh, programming language. So you basically, if you want to change um, uh, some information in your database, then you would lock that row or lock that column or whatever it is. Uh, change the data, change that data so not so nobody. You lock it so nobody else can change it. You change the data and then unlock it. It's a kind of the same thing in Clojure. Uh, rather than just defining a list or a, or a, or a vector, you actually here we're actually defining a, a vector. It's going to be called players. We're actually wrapping this definition of a vector inside an, what we call an atom. And this means we can actually change uh, the data. So when we put information inside this vector, uh, inside this array, as it were, it will actually change. It's not going to create a copy. It's actually going to change inside it. <coughs> but when it does so, it's going to change it in, in this separate area of the running memory called software transactional memory, um, and actually make sure that nothing else can change this value at the same time. So you've got built-in um, yeah, built locking, built-in uh, consistency into uh, managing those values. Uh, so I can define an atom uh, called players, and 
then I can basically, uh, we use a separate, a different function called swap to basically uh, add player one to that, uh, uh, to that, uh, that vector, that, uh, that atom vector. Uh, and then if I want to get the value, we use a different function called deref to, uh, to get that value out. And we can also use a shortcut of this, um, uh, this at symbol uh, to uh, also get the same thing. So it's the same, it's, it's essentially just a shortcut for the deref uh, function. So it, it, it is possible to kind of change data uh, and, uh, and have mutable state with enclosure, but most of the stuff you're going to do uh, is immutable. Uh, and just makes it so much easier and simple and your program is so much more consistent um, uh, and easier to understand because you're not mutating state here and everywhere. And when you do want to change state, it's usually it's kind of separated out um, area and it's a very specific area that you're changing the state inside. Um, and that's about all I've got time for. I can spend all day talking about closure uh, here, but there's lots of stuff uh, you can do. If you go to my... Um, <coughs> Uh, practically.github.closure.web website. There's a, basically you can go through and build uh, a very simple web app um, there using using Jetty, for people are familiar with Jetty, but doing so in a, a closure way. Uh, and you get to see how, uh, how the project works, how, how the lining works, which is the build management tool. You get to see um, what you have to do basic simple routing on there, it's very simple. And it deals with, so basically what it does, it allows you to take in a, res uh, a response from your browser, it goes through Jetty, there's something called Ring, which turns that response into a map, and then basically the rest of the program is just basically processing the, the request map, and then turning it eventually into a response map and sending it back, and then that gets sent back to your browser as, a, as some content, some web content. So it's fairly straightforward, and it just shows you how easy it is to kind of do uh, things in closure programming. So thank you very much for coming.